Hello, welcome back to Closing Ceremonies of BYU MUN 31, our very first ever virtual diplomacy camp. Thank you so much for your participation today. It's been fantastic. I know that everybody struggled with different technical issues throughout the day as, as we all do in our lives now that are controlled by the pandemic, but I really think everybody did a great job handling it. So thank you. I am going to turn the time over to um, the director of BYU Model UN, Corey Leonard, who is the assistant director of the Kennedy Center for International Studies at BYU. And Corey will introduce our first speaker to you, our first diplomat. And after that point, we will then move into the awards section of closing ceremonies. And then we have a few more surprises for you after that as well. Hello, delegates. Uh, congratulations on an excellent day. Uh, it's a, a little bit shorter day than usual, but maybe longer because we're all online. I want to congratulate you for your hard work. And for those of you who, for whom this is your first experience, welcome. And we hope that you've had a good experience. Uh, we want to let you know that this will not be the end of the opportunities that will come your way. Uh, we will continue to send you periodic emails, including one uh, later this week with a certificate of participation as well as an invitation to attend a career discussion next week that will be held on Zoom with John Dinkelman of the U.S. Department of State. He's a Deputy Assistant Secretary of, uh, and he will be speaking about careers in the U.S. Foreign Service. So for those of you who'd like to become diplomats like Mr. George Ward and Mr. Joey Lovett, as well as Ambassador Jones, uh, you can learn more uh, in the coming weeks and months about opportunities to, to develop your leadership skills and career opportunities in a wide array of fields. It's my great pleasure to introduce George Ward. George, who began his career uh, at the State Department as a Presidential Management Fellow on September 10th, 2001, the very day before the terrorist attacks of September 11th. Uh, as you can imagine, that had an impact on him. He's an inter uh, international relations and economics alum of Brigham Young University. He also earned a graduate degree from the University of Delaware in economics and another graduate degree in public administration from the George Washington University. After that first fellowship at the State Department, he passed the Foreign Service exam and since 2003 has served in the following cities, Warsaw, Poland, Washington, D.C. in the United States, Taiwan, uh, Baghdad, Iraq, and Singapore, and his most recent assignment that he just completed was in New York at the U.S. mission to the United Nations, where he uh, just recently completed that posting. Please join me in a warm welcome on our YouTube live stream to our closing keynote speaker, George Ward. Thank you, Corey, and thank you for everyone. Thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I think it's fantastic that you have uh, this opportunity to, to study diplomacy um, at your age and at your, at your period of uh, education. Um, for me, I didn't really know much about diplomacy. It's actually uh, my, my first introduction to it or, or the first seed, seed that was planted for me um, about being a diplomat and understanding that that was actually a career path one could have was uh, from that moment happened just down the hall from where Corey's sitting now, there was a bulletin board in the Kennedy Center and there was a flyer about, you know, asking the rhetorical question, would you like to be a career diplomat and live overseas and, and have all these great adventures? And I had I'd never heard of this before. So uh, the seed planted for was planted for me there, right there in the Kennedy Center. So I think it's um, it, it's wonderful that, that we have such a place uh, uh, at BYU and and but reaching out to various communities to really pr promote uh, diplomacy, what it means and and what it is as an opportunity for for everybody. Um, I hope today, even though you've spent just a few hours to, together today, um, recognize that along your educational journey, every lecture, every lesson, and every interactive experience that you have, such as this, even for just a few hours, can actually change literally change your perspective ever so slightly or change your paradigm how you see and perceive the world and your place in it. Um, having worked as a diplomat representing U.S. interests for um, uh, over 15 years, and then as Corey mentioned, most re recently I spent a lot of time negotiating uh, in the U.N. Security Council uh, U.S. foreign policy goals. 
uh, for the past three and a half years, I've learned that the tools and the craft of diplomacy very much reflect tools for successfully navigating life and relationships that we have. Um, let me share with you a few of those. Uh, uh, diplomacy really all, it really comes down to building relationships and advancing goals with those who you may or may not share uh, similar views with. And you do that, that through persuasion, through negotiation. Um, but before I touch on that briefly, I just want to ask the question, why does diplomacy fail? And what happens when it fails? Well, the short answer to that, there's, there's kind of complexities behind, behind why diplomacy fails. But um, one of the biggest enemies of diplomacy is ultranationalism. Um, I hope some of you felt a little bit today in your various breakout groups that really diplomacy is about coming together and sharing different perspectives, different views, and understanding you can't go in and just, I, I, I don't, I doubt anybody had success in going in and immediately persuading your whole group to go with your way and nobody had any, you know, different perspectives. Um, kind of on a larger scale, ultranationalism is about, it is, instills distrust. It does not value co cooperation or collaboration. It's blind to the value of alliances or, and it's blind to the idea of the need to, of recognizing that there's other valued uh, perspectives out there, other valued people that we need to recognize, other different nationalities, and we all work together to achieve the same goal. Um, and ultimately, the failure of diplomacy is reflected when war happens, that's the ultimate failure of diplomacy. So I, I just wanna share with you a couple of points, um, kind of things to take away with you. Um, tools of diplomats, as I said, that you can apply in your real world that maybe you've got a, you've had a little bit of experience with in your, uh, in your exposure to the work of the UN, if for some of you have done model UN and for those who have, you have worked to, to today. Um, Number one, it's all about communication. At the core of building re personal relationships, which really is at the heart of diplomacy, um, you need to take, you need to invest time in talking through issues. That's critical. So much of what we do, I mean, diplomats aren't necessarily, you know, in, in Hollywood and in movies, it's not diplomats that necessarily make the cent center feature of adventure movies. That's because most of the time we're behind closed doors in conference rooms, sitting around a table, reading prepared talking points um, with other people who are representing their countries. And it's kind of a slow churn of trying to find convergences and, and areas to agree with. And there's a lot of behind the work that goes before you even get to the conference room. So it's a lot of memos, a lot of, a lot of uh, writing and analyzing. It's not that sexy, so to speak, but it it's really comes down to, to communication. Um, working and listening and understanding each other, learning how to speak concisely, and, and also learning the language of those who you're interacting with. The State Department spends uh, hundreds of millions of dollars every year to train diplomats to go and, you know, everywhere we go as diplomats, we're required almost without exception to learn the language of the host country we're going to. That's because you're most effective when you can sit down speak their language, break bread with them, so to speak, in their culture, in their environment, and let them know that you're there with them. Uh, you want to bring them to understand your, your perspective. Um, that leads me to my second point. So first point is all about communication. Second point is respect. Um, and to throw out a buzzword that, you're, uh, that uh, is kind of thrown around um, society today, this council culture idea. <laughs> In diplomacy, there is no council culture. You cannot counsel any country uh, any more than you can like literally counsel uh, uh, the idea of counseling a, a human being just cannot physically happen. You can deal with bad actors and governments by isolating them. We did that a lot in the Security Council, um, but ultimately they're still there. They're still a country. Um, um, you can build alliances against them, impose embargoes, implement sanctions, declare war on them. But at the end of the day, they are still a country, a nation of people sharing the same planet who you need to deal with, whether you like it or not. They are there sharing the same globe. You got to deal with them. You got to know how to, uh, how to interact with them. And that, that comes down to a deal of respect. Um, maybe taking this to a personal level, countries are kind of like siblings. You know, those of you, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody out, out there has 192 siblings. Um, if you do, it did, I'd feel sorry for you, but uh, there's, uh, but that's 193 members of the, of the UN, uh, 193 countries in the UN. 
Um, you can't unadopt a sibling or kick them off the planet or kick them out of the family, uh, no matter what. They're there and you need to deal with them. If you invest enough time and energy, you can always find something to agree on. I think, you know, there's, there's sibling disputes, there's uh, neighborly disputes, there's friend disputes, but there's always somewhere, there's always gonna be common ground to be found with whoever you, you are dealing with and understand that it's really about respect for each other. Number three, it's the value of alliances. This is a little bit more nuanced, um, but very few wars have been, have been won without an alliance, some sort of an alliance stepping in and helping. Um, those who are familiar with US history, it was not just a, a, a spinoff. This, this was just not, not just a breakaway from the UK that started in America. We had France, we had Spain, we had other allies who, who stepped in and really were part of, the, part of it. Any major conflict is, is resolved through alliances. So there, that's once more, I, I mentioned in the beginning of my remarks that um, ultra-nationalism really is the enemy of diplomacy and nowhere is that more true in, in looking at just historical fact of the fact that alliances matter. Um, going in alone is rarely the best option or, or rarely more effective than building a base of like-minded supporters who want the same goal or the same outcome as you. In my uh, three and a half years working in the UN Security Council, we always relied on, on other like-minded members. In the Security Council, there are 15 members. Um, they represent different continents, um, so it's, it's fairly widespread. There's the core permanent five members as well, as you, you are probably aware, the US, the UK, France, uh, China, and Russia. Um, every I think without exception, every one of the goals that I was able to help successfully advance um, in my time in the Security Council meant that I needed to rely on, uh, on partners, the UK, France, Germany, Japan was there uh, for a couple of years, Kuwait, Dominican Republic, others have, and, and um, to kind of build alliances, uh, build enough support behind a, a given policy or idea that we could stand against the opposition that came from other members of the Security Council. So in your personal life, think of think friend groups, clubs, communities. All of these are microcosms of what happens on a global scale among countries, the value of being aligned with those who share a common interest. Find those so that you're not isolated. Finally, my last one, number four, uh, which is empathy. Um, you may have heard a similar phrase that you never judge someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Um, that's why we as diplomats, we go and we live in these countries. We don't just uh, negotiate from afar or, or from Washington. We actually pick up, we go and we live with our families uh, in these countries. We live in their neighborhoods, we attend their schools, we mingle with them at church or uh, community centers and everything with these people so that we can kind of really understand what, where are they coming from? What is their perspective? What are their interests? Um, once we really understand somebody and their culture, we can then go back and we can frame our policy position based on what we are understanding, our understanding is of where they're coming from and what are the levers, so to speak, that would really, what are the things that they would, that would, that, that would reverberate with them most effectively, um, this common ground idea. Um, with that, I'd also say that, you know, with empathy, there's also understanding that we don't, you know, and nowhere in our foreign policy do we, um, do we, you know, judge or rule out an entire country? Yes, we are having, uh, we are, or we are in conflict with North Korea, with Iran, and at various times with China and Russia and others. But um, we're very clear that when we're dealing with China in our interactions, it's with the, um, it's with the Chinese government, and it's not with the people of China. The trade dispute is with the Chinese government and their regulations is not with the 1.4 billion Chinese people. Same with Iran, you know, the, the nuclear deal that we are, we are working on and, and the, the interest in keeping Iran away from having uh, these nuclear powers. It's, it's about our mistrust of the Iranian authorities in power at the moment. It's not against the Iranian people. So we don't ever judge an entire nation because of bad actors leading them. 
um, just the same as you would not be want to be judged, you know, simply by what one of your leaders in our country is doing at a given time or what he or she happens to be saying at a, at a time. Um, we 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 don't do that um, in in terms of that. That's not effective way of like of, of having this this empathy that I'm talking about. So. Just to review real quick, number one, communication, communication, communication. It's really all about that. Number two, respect. Number three, the value of having alliances. And number four, empathy. I hope you can take some of these and, and recognize how valuable they are in your real life and building relationships and know that that's, um, that's really where we as diplomats go in terms of our, our craft and what we do. Um, Thank you for this. I know uh, I'm standing kind of between now and the award ceremony. You're probably all more interested in that, but I really appreciate this opportunity and congratulate you for taking this time on this weekend to do this. I hope it's been really valuable. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. We really appreciate those words. I especially in particular appreciated the points that you made at the end regarding empathy. Um, I think that's very easy for us to start to judge groups of people by the people that we do know or are aware of. And sometimes with foreign countries, the only people in those countries we, we may have any knowledge about are leaders. And so we start to judge larger groups based on those few examples that we may have available to us. Um, so I think that's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, we are now prepared to move into the awards section of the ceremony for BYU MUN 31. Before I do that, just so you know what will happen afterwards, because I don't want everybody to get off thinking that it's it's over. Um, we have one more diplomat who's prepared to address us, Mr. Joey Levitt, um, who some of you had the opportunity to meet as he roved through meeting rooms today, um, visiting with some of you. Uh, Joey will be speaking about his experiences um, serving uh, the United States of America as a diplomat, and then uh, he will also take questions. So all of you have the Google Voice phone number that we posted in your um, committee rooms. You can use that to submit questions for Joey when we move to that portion of the event. Um, I think Corey just pushed him down to, to be sitting like he was gonna answer questions now, but we're, we're actually going to do the, um, the awards first uh, and then move into questions. So if you have questions you're thinking about, go ahead and you can start sending those as soon as you um, decide what you would like to ask. So I will now begin uh, with our first set of awards. These are for speeches that were submitted before the conference happened today. And just so that you know, for each set of awards, there are three categories, honorable mention, outstanding, and distinguished, okay? And so um, we've awarded for pre-submitted speeches in the category of outstanding. We have awarded, um, the delegation of Greece represented by Sage Doyle, the delegation of India represented by William Johnson. And in the distinguished category, we have awarded um, the delegation from South Sudan, which is represented by Rodrigo Vasquez Hernandez and the delegation of Germany represented by Scout Jones. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much for your submissions. Our committee enjoyed reviewing them. Then for speeches that were given today during the conference, again, there are three categories. I'll start with honorable mention. And if you haven't noticed, we're moving in alphabetical order according to the name of the country. So that's how these are done in terms of the order. So honorable mention for speeches given today, we have the Central African Republic represented by Kendra Collins, China represented by Amelia Young, China represented by Eric Highland. Egypt, represented by Sophia Christensen. Greece, represented by Kars Plante. Greece, represented by McKenna Spackman. Israel, represented by Celeste Dorantes. Portugal, represented by Natalie Rust. Republic of the Congo, represented by Pierce Briner. Spain, represented by Burton Gus Toon. And the United States of America, represented by Emily Morrison. Congratulations, delegates. In the outstanding category for speeches, we have the delegation of Austria, represented by Anna Anderson, Egypt, represented by Clarissa Hernandez, France, represented by Derry Thatcher, France, represented by Haley MacArthur, Greece, represented by Sage Doyle, Russia, represented by Jacob Wolford, 
South Sudan, represented by Rodrigo Vasquez Fernandez, Sweden, represented by Eleanor Smith, the Republic of the Congo, represented by Hunter Heath, and Uruguay, represented by Brady Bryant. Congratulations, delegates, on the speeches that you gave today. And in the distinguished category, we have Austria, represented by Reagan Manwaring, Central African Republic, represented by Kaylee Rowley, Germany, represented by Jenna Norris, Germany, represented by Stella Otteson, Guatemala, represented by Isabella Grimm, India, represented by Anna Gleason, India, represented by William Johnson, Russia, represented by Rosalind Janine Neville, and Sweden, represented by Will Widener. Again, everybody did such a great job today. I know this was an intimidating format to present in. We were very pleased with the work done by delegates across the committees. Thank you so much for your great work. The next category of awards are for resolutions that were submitted ahead of committee today. So keep in mind that for the work that you did today in committee, whether it was taking a pre-submitted resolution and turning it into a resolution that passed um, or taking everything from scratch, not with a pre-submitted resolution to start from and working with it, awards for that work is being given when we give awards to delegations for their work uh, today. So this is for the ones that were submitted ahead of time. Uh, so in the honorable mention category, we have um, Israel represented by Sandra Mimchi. In the outstanding category, we have the delegation of India represented by Anna Gleason and the delegation of India represented by Max Johnson. For distinguished awards, we have the delegation of Austria represented by Reagan Manwaring, Brazil represented by Zachary Knutson, the Central African Republic represented by Kayla Rowley, Germany represented by Jenna Norris, Greece represented by Sage Doyle, Israel represented by Celeste Dorantes, Sweden represented by Eleanor Smith, and Sweden represented by Will Widener. Thank you for the work that you did even leading up to the conference and of course for all the work everyone has done today. All right, we are now moving over to position papers. So this was a very heavy lift, we recognize that, and this is probably where you spent the greatest amount of your time before the conference, was researching and putting together a position paper for your country regarding the topics that you addressed. Um, our, I've had a lot of great feedback from your directors who were the main ones doing the reviews of these, and we're very impressed with the amount of work that you did. So um, congratulations to everyone. And now I'll recognize those delegations whose um, submissions were particularly outstanding. In the honorable mention category, we have Austria represented by Courtney Wright, Austria represented by Dominic Callor, China represented by Amelia Young, China represented by Eric Highland, Germany represented by Hanson Lin, Germany represented by Scout Jones, Greece represented by Kars Plante, India, represented by Drake Frankberry, India, represented by Lillian Watson, Israel, represented by Celeste Durantes, Israel, represented by Sandri, Sandri Mimchi, I apologize, Portugal, represented by Natalie Rust, Uruguay, represented by Alec Roberts, and Zimbabwe, represented by Alyssa Gillian. Gillian. In the outstanding category, Brazil, represented by Zachary Knutson, China, rep represented by Jacob Casper. China, represented by Libby Henry. France, represented by Courtney Bailing. France, represented by Haley MacArthur. Germany, represented by Stella, Otis Stella Otteson. Greece, represented by Carl Mercurio. Greece, represented by Liam Gleason. Greece, represented by McKenna Spackman. India, represented by William Johnson. Israel, represented by Lila Anderson. Lila Anderson. Sweden, represented by Will Widener, the Republic of the Congo, represented by Hunter Heath, and Uruguay, represented by Mariana Ferreira. In the distinguished category, we have Austria, represented by Reagan Manwaring, Egypt, represented by Clarissa Hernandez, Germany, represented by Jenna Norris, Greece, represented by Sage Doyle, Guatemala, represented by Dua Khan, Guatemala, represented by Isabella Grimm, India, represented by Anna Gleason. Israel, represented by Valerie Springer. South Sudan, represented by 
Rodrigo Vasquez Hernandez. Sweden, represented by Eleanor Smith. Uruguay, represented by Sheila Amavor. Caitlin Simmons, sorry, Zimbabwe, represented by Caitlin Simmons. Congratulations, congratulations, delegates, on your hard work on these papers. And I hope that you saw how that translated into the ability to talk about your topics during the session today and to do outstanding work on the working papers and resolutions. Um, we also have an award uh, that you, if you're familiar with BYU MUN, you may not have heard of it before. Uh, we're referring to it as the Diplomacy Award. This is for work that was done in caucuses. So outside of, you know, speeches given on the committee room floor during formal session, this is informal session work that we're recognizing in particular. People that are, you know, negotiating and, you know, helping get things done in a way that moves the meeting forward. Um, so in this, and we, uh, because this is a new award, uh, these are all distinguished awards that we're giving today. The, the country of, the delegation of China, represented by Annie DeBry, China, represented by Libby Han Henri, Egypt, represented by Isaac Leonard, Germany, represented by Stella Audison, Greece, represented by Carl Mercurio, Guatemala, represented by Isabella Grimm, Guatemala, represented by Dua Khan, India, represented by William Johnson, Israel, represented by Sandri Mimchi, Japan, represented by Kyle Jensen, Republic of the Congo, represented by Pierce Breiner, South Sudan, represented by Rodrigo Vasquez Hernandez, Sweden, represented by Will Widener, the Republic of the Congo, represented by Hunter Heath. Thank you so much for your work today in session, delegates. And in the final category, this is a delegation award for overall work in all of the categories across MUN for work that was uh, done today. So uh, we will begin in the honorable mention category. And I'm noticing as I do this that my sheet is not in alphabetical order. So let me see if I can figure this out in my head really fast. I think I can. Okay, uh, we'll start with honorable mention. Central African Republic represented by Kendra Collins. China represented by Eric Highland. Egypt represented by Isaac Leonard. France represented by Courtney Bailing. Germany, represented by Stella Audison. Greece, represented by Karst Plante. Israel, represented by Lila Anderson. Republic of the Congo, represented by Pierce Breiner. Rosalind Janine, I'm sorry, your um, country wasn't attached to your name on the list. Uruguay, represented by Alec Roberts. United States of America, represented by Emily Morrison. Zimbabwe, represented by Caitlin Simmons and Uruguay represented by Mariana Ferreira. As I mentioned, I didn't get those in alphabetical order, I apologize. Okay, in the outstanding category, we have China represented by Annie DeBry, France represented by Haley MacArthur, Germany represented by Jana Norris, Greece represented by Carl Mercurio, Greece represented by Liam Gleason, France, represented by Haley MacArthur. Checking for alphabetical order again. India, represented by Anna Gleason. India, represented by William Johnson. Japan, represented by Kyle Jensen. Portugal, represented by Natalie Rust. Russia, rep represented by Jacob Wolford. South Sudan, represented by Rodrigo Vasquez Hernandez. Uruguay, represented by Brady Bryant. Zimbabwe, represented by Luke Roth. In the distinguished category, Austria represented by Anna Anderson, Austria represented by Reagan Manwaring, Egypt represented by Clarissa Hernandez, Egypt represented by Sophie Christensen, Greece represented by Sage Doyle, Guatemala represented by Isabella Grimm, India represented by Drake, Drake Frankberry, Israel represented by Sandri Memchi, Israel represented by Celeste Durantes, Israel represented by Valerie Springer, Russia, represented by Rosalind Janine Neville. Congratulations, delegate, delegates, on your outstanding work. I'm really very pleased. This was um, quite, quite the um, effort for our students to create this program, to create an entirely virtual way to engage and model UN. 
I think that you have all shown us that it is possible. There's definitely technical issues connected to it, but you did very outstanding work. I came in and out of sessions throughout the day and I listened to people giving speeches. I visited working groups during caucuses and I was really impressed with the level of conversation that you were having, the engagement that you had and the real interest that you have in helping make our world a better place. So thank you for all of the work that you put into it. Your work really does make everyone else's experience better. So thank you. I am now going to turn the time over to Corey to introduce our next diplomat to you. Thank you, Marie. And again, we want to reiterate our congratulations to all of you who have worked so hard and for your achievements today. Uh, again, we know this is a very uh, it's a lot of work and, and it's great that you have taken the time to do this and we're really proud of your of your efforts. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our first ever Diplomacy Camp Fellow. Uh, jo Joey Levitt is a US Foreign Service Officer with the US Department of State who has served in Saudi Arabia, El Salvador, India, and Washington DC his most recent post, uh, no thanks to COVID, which was disrupted, was in the UAE. He uh, studied Arab Arabic for a year in Syria as an undergraduate on his way to receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Middle East Studies Arabic, as well as a, a JD law degree from Brigham Young University. He and his wife are the parents of four children. He enjoys trail running, photography, and apparently forcing his children to listen to David Bowie albums on replay, which we can support. Um, we appreciate his effort in being part of this first diplomacy camp. As you probably noticed, he was observing and um, in some cases interacting with your committees. We'd like, we'd like to turn the floor to him for a few concluding comments. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to make it known how much fun this was. This was a great time. Um, there's a lot of things I could be doing on a Saturday. This was probably one of the best things that, uh, that I could have chosen to do. It was, it was exciting and fun to watch all of you students interact with one another, to observe your mastery of the material. That was really impressive. Uh, my comments, which I'll keep short, are not going to really touch on the substance of the things that you talked about, because you know so much more about it uh, than, than I do. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you for, for making it a, a great time. If, if the um, camp had gone on for another couple hours, I don't know if you would have liked that, but it would have been really exciting uh, and interesting for me. Just uh, a few points of, I guess, feedback from the observations that I made while I was while I was wandering around. Um, uh, apparently, many of you are new to Model UN, and uh, I I wouldn't believe that if uh, if, if it wasn't told to me. Everybody, without exception, that uh, that I observed handled themselves in just such a, a, a professional and um, industrious way that uh, it, 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 it was really like watching a cadre of uh, newly hired diplomats. I, I kept thinking that to myself, there really wasn't much difference between what I saw um, uh, among these high school students and, and what we see in uh, groups of, of newly hired diplomats that come in and, and, and are learning the trade. And that comment is, is, um, is intended to, um, to just highlight the kind, of, the, the kind of work that you all did and the kind of preparation that you put in. That, I, I mean that sincerely. It was really impressive to watch. Um, another thing that, that was really interesting and impressive to me uh, was how well everybody handled the, um, the technical issues. I think that there might be a, a tendency among, among some of us to, to think, well, the real work of Model UN or the real work of diplomacy was sort of put on hold here and there 
while we negotiated these technological hiccups. But that hasn't been my experience in my diplomatic career. Um, technology and trying to make it work and trying to find workarounds when it doesn't work is, is part of diplomacy. Um, I was in the United Arab Emirates uh, about six, seven, eight months ago when uh, coronavirus reached over there and 70, 80, 90 percent of our work for the first month or two months uh, as we tried to figure out how uh, to, to, to handle things was figuring out how we were going to um, technologically make things work. So, and, and a big portion of figuring out how to make things work technologically was simply handling the, the, the hiccups um, that happened. For instance, you know, receiving hundreds or thousands of phone calls um, at the embassy when you normally receive a few dozen in a day um, causes, caused servers to crash. We had to figure out how to um, keep updating information that was changing by the hour um, as the host government adapted to changing circumstances, their stances on things and their policies were changing. And you have to communicate that to um, American citizens and to our colleagues in Washington. And it was just a huge undertaking that <laughs> in some cases resulted in, in you know, temporary mass confusion. And so, um, I guess I give that little bit of feedback to encourage everybody to, uh, to, to take heart in the way that, that you all just kind of rolled with um, the, the, the few little hiccups that, that we saw today. That was a part of real diplomacy um, that, that happens in the day-to-day -day lives of, um, of diplomats. Um, uh, I think just one other point of feedback that, that I wanted to offer was, um, again, I, I suppose I should be offering like constructive uh, feedback, like pointing out what I saw that maybe could have been better, but I just didn't, I just didn't see much. Um, I, or, or maybe I was just so um, taken with, with how impressed I was with everything that, uh, that I'm just kind of focusing on what I saw that was really amazing. I was really impressed at how well um, all of you were able to take your thoughts and the knowledge that you had and that you had developed in your research and succinctly and clearly state points. That is really hard to do. And, and I'm sure you, you felt that today when um, you know, the, the, the mentors or the chairs would say, look, you've got 25 seconds, go. And you've got 25 seconds to make a point. Like that is scary. That's really, really hard. Um, and it's not just hard if you're a high school student, it's hard if you're a seasoned diplomat. It's hard if you're an ambassador. Um, so uh, again, I was just really impressed with that. I think that that is a skill that uh, will serve any of you well, anywhere you go um, in your career, but definitely on the diplomatic front, there have been times, um, uh, I remember just one time in particular uh, in India, I ran the, um, among other things, the adoption program where American uh, adopting parents could adopt Indian children. And we had um, a tragedy take place here in the United States where an American couple um, uh, lost their adopted Indian child down in Texas. And there was there were some allegations of foul play on the part of the parents. And the Indians uh, and the Indian government was understandably really upset about this. Um, and our ambassador got involved uh, trying to ensure that India didn't shut down the adoption program because of this incident. And the, the point I'm making is that as the point person for adoptions in the country of India, it was my job on numerous occasions to, to what, we, what we call brief the ambassador on what was going on. And as the point person on adoptions for India, of course I had you know, tomes of information about this incident that had happened in the background and the laws and so on and so forth. And the ambassador or, or whoever, um, uh, you know, if you are in the, the UN Security Council and you need to, to, to make a speech, it's gotta be brief. That's why they say, I'm gonna brief the ambassador. I'm gonna brief so-and-so. Um, and so, you know, you've got 90 seconds to boil down um, all of this information, most of it 
being relevant, that's a hard thing to do. So my, my point in, in sharing that um, experience is just to point out that that art of stating in, in a very short way all the things that you know is a real world skill that plays into the work of diplomacy at, at, at virtually every level, I think. So um, again, I'll just kind of close my, um, my, my feedback portion here just by reiterating uh, the point. I hope I'm not being too like um, too over the top or effusive in, in my praise, but um, I, I was just really, uh, I was just really impressed with the work that everybody did with the way that you interacted with one another. And uh, it, it made the, the, the morning extremely enjoyable for me. So, um, so thank you. Um, and if, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm ready for them. We do in fact have some questions. Um, so thank you so much, Joey, for sharing some of your insights. Um, I'm actually going to refer back to the TAs. They're running the question submission form. So um, if any of the TAs have a question that they want to read out, if you could raise your hand, Corey can highlight you so that you can share the question with Joey. Or just unmute yourself and start speaking so he'll know to highlight you. I can see the questions in the question bank, so maybe I'll just read them. Okay, um, so we have our representative from Greece who was on the General Assembly would like to know your recommendation for a good set of college classes to take to prepare for a career in international diplomacy. That is a good question with a lot of different answers. Um, I. It, it, I'm kind of going on my opinion here. I think that uh, the, the diplomatic corps of the United States benefits from um, officers that have a wide range of, of backgrounds. Of course, there is nothing wrong, and in fact, everything right about a traditional um, uh, higher education background in say political science or economics or international relations. Um, that said, though, I think that we benefit, again, as a diploma diplomatic corps from having people with, with different backgrounds um, in hard sciences, for instance, even, even fine arts, um, things like that. When you study different subjects, you develop a different way of looking at problems and solving problems. And when you are in get engaged in diplomacy, it is so valuable to be able to sit around a table and hear feedback and hear ideas from people who don't all think the same. So it's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but <laughs> I really think that it's, it's accurate. Do what interests you and what you feel you can do well and where you feel you can make contributions in university. And that will be um, extremely valuable uh, in the practice of diplomacy, if that's what you want to do. I'll do a follow up on that one, Joey. Uh, I have a friend of mine who works for USAID. For the students who aren't familiar, that's the um, agency of the United States government that handles our humanitarian aid. And he's a neuroscientist, uh, but he spends all of his time working with representatives from other governments to decide how to deploy our aid. And his science background gives him the ability to analyze statistical results about how the aid is used, which is not something he ever thought about in undergrad. He talks all the time about how he thought he was, you know, going to spend his life in a lab. Um, so I, I, that definitely speaks to the idea that different backgrounds can contribute. But maybe you could share with the students a couple of your favorite classes that you took as a student. Yeah, sure. Uh, gosh, that is a good question. I, so my, my background was in Middle East studies and, and Arabic. So th that's where my interest lies. So I, I think that the most interesting courses I took were in um, uh, uh, Islamic movements. I took a course on Islamic movements. I took a course on Islamic art, which um, I still remember. I don't know how much that helps me in everyday diplomacy, but, um, but I loved that course. 
and and certainly like capstone classes, which I think most majors have, where you have to write a major paper or you get to write a major paper, is it's so helpful to be able to research and put information together and figure out arguments. Um, so th I think that those are the ones that come to mind most quickly. As a student, did you have the opportunity to study abroad? I did. Um, fortunately, part of the Middle East Studies Arabic major is a requirement that you spend a semester in, um, in the Arab world. And so in 2003, 2004, uh, we went to uh, Damascus, Syria. Uh, we went for a semester, uh, my wife and I and my oldest daughter, who she was about six months old when we went. And um, so we spent a semester there, but it turns out like my wife got a job working at a local school and she was making better money than she could make back here in the US. <laughs> it was like, you know, someone in her early 20s. So we stayed another semester and um, actually like made a little bit of money that we, that, that we brought home. So we stayed for about a year. That was back in the time period when I think I first met you, Joey, uh, when yeah, you were your right. dad. Um, so we have another question from a student who I don't know their delegation, but their question is, um, from your perspective, how does MUN compare to real diplomacy? What other activities might you recommend to students interested in learning diplomatic skills? Yeah, um, I, I, I tried not to uh, butt into what was going on today too much because I know there was limited time and I didn't want to take up the, the students' time. I did have a short conversation um, with, uh, with, with a few students uh, where um, I admitted that I never did Model UN um, in high school or, or college. This was kind of my first exposure. So I, I didn't, it took me about a half hour to figure out what was going on. Um, so, but, but maybe because I've never done it before, I had kind of a good perspective to answer that question. Um, I, I was really impressed with how uh, closely what was happening today mirrors what uh, actually happens in the hallways of, of diplomacy. And of course, Mr. Ward, who we heard from earlier, I mean, he had a front row seat to how that happens uh, at, at the UN, but certainly even in uh, embassies around the world as foreign service officers leave the embassy and go out into the host country, make contacts with interlocutors from the foreign government, the, again, the types of skills and, and, and they're, they're things that, that you and Corey have mentioned too, as well as Mr. Ward, um, simply the, the ability to have conversations with people based on respect and empathy, um, you know, the, the ability to disagree without uh, resorting to blows or without resorting to, um, to unkind or unproductive types of rhetoric. Um, those are things that we saw today and they are absolutely reflected in, um, I think they're absolutely reflected in the hallways of real diplomacy all around the world. So a, a very, very close mirroring between what was going on today and, and what happens um, abroad and again here in the United States. Thank you, Joey. And thank you, Mr. Ward as well. Um, we really appreciate both of you taking the time to talk to our students today. Um, delegates, we very much appreciate your time and attention today. Um, Corey, is there, are, are we going to push the slide? Okay, we're going to, yes. we're going to do two things to give you options. Um, our Secretary General will officially close BYU MUN 31, and then we will push a slideshow that has pictures from t throughout the day. So as, when the slideshow ends, it will be over. You can simply um, leave the link. But we, again, I really do appreciate your time and attention and work today. You worked very hard. So Ms. Secretary General, Madam Secretary General. Thank you. Delegates, thank you for your participation today. The 31st annual BYU MUN session is now adjourned. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Corey, Marie, and Joey. We, oh my gosh, thank you so much, everyone.